Have you ever had a random piece of hardware and thought, hmm, it would be pretty cool if I could just run my own code on this device to add a new feature or just to play with it? Well, because that's one of the first things that I think about when I hold a random piece of electronic device. If you are especially a beginner, the tips that I'm going to share here might save you quite a lot of time and also money. But more importantly, it will save you from tons of frustrations on your own adventures. This device is a temperature data logger and it is used for agricultural purposes. Probably you can use it for other purposes as well. But I found a listing on a creek like website and the seller was originally a farmer. He was using this to measure the temperature changes in his barn. And I got curious and go to the web and actually there are quite a lot of literature on this topic. And the summary is basically if you have happy cows, you would get more milk. So this is actually quite a useful product for the farmers. And according to him, it has worked more than six months. And I think it's quite impressive because it only promises to work 90 days without a battery change. But there is a catch. You cannot change the batteries in this device. It is basically a disposable temperature data logger. I think it should be illegal to sell a device which you cannot change the batteries. Even if they have a rechargeable one. But anyway, this is not the topic of this video. Before investing time or money on a certain product before getting it, I usually go and check the FCC regulation forms and they are publicly available and you can find internal photos and external photos and all test reports. This is important because you can actually go and see the internal photos of this device and decide whether or not if it is worth your time and money. You cannot really, for example, see what the MCU is here, but if you see a black blob or something like that, probably you won't be able to upload your own code because those devices are mass produced. But for this specific device, I can tell that this is the microcontroller and this is probably the memory IC and probably this is used for measuring the temperature changes in this device. But also one of the important things that I can say is there is an area with lots of pins and marked with J1. Usually it stands for JTAG and usually you can upload your own firmware using this port. Also I can see other test pins as well. This is promising because you can also do your own tests using these pins. These are the main hints that FCC page gives to you. And actually this is the time that I decide how much money that I should be paying for this device. For example, I cannot really see what this microcontroller is and also this sensor is gunked out. I cannot see that one as well. And this is probably a memory chip and I am pretty confident about that. And also the buttons doesn't work much and also antenna chip as well. And the rest of the circuit looked like it is used for regulating the voltages. So what I would go for is I would just assume this one worth like 50 cents and this one maybe memory chip well they are usually not that expensive and i wouldn't give any value to that so i would pay around one dollar for each port maximum because you won't be able to use the battery and there is a big chance that it is already dead so you shouldn't count that one so if i were generous i would pay maximum one dollar for this port but of course you might get lucky because here, for example, I valued this one for 50 cents. But if you receive a more expensive chip, of course you would be happy. But if you don't get a good one, you won't regret your decision. For my case, I paid around $1 for a bunch of things. And some of them have also humidity measurement capability as well. But None of them actually work because well, they are disposable humidity and temperature sensors. So it has no use for the farmer. And this one also doesn't work either. I didn't pay a lot for these devices, of course, but the farm was a little bit further away from the city and it was a solid 60 kilometers bicycle ride, but I was fine with it. 
because I was looking for some excuse to do some exercise. As the name suggests, reverse engineering is doing the same steps that engineers follow during their development, but in reverse order. So first I am removing the screws because that's the last step that they do. Some people wrote me that they are not feeling confident in reverse engineering because they are not engineers. I understand that reverse engineering can seem like a daunting task, especially if you don't have an engineering background. However, I want to assure you that you don't need to be an engineer to be a successful at reverse engineering. It's a skill that can be learned and mastered with practice and dedication. It requires critical thinking and attention to details and problem solving skills, all of which are skills that can be developed regardless of your educational background. You too can develop your skills in reverse engineering by starting small, taking on simple projects like this one and gradually building up your knowledge and experience. So finally I got in the case and this is the battery that is drained up entirely and the board is more or less like the one in the FCC documentation and this is the battery that you cannot replace because it is spot welded to the battery and soldered to the board. I still can see what's written on the parts but here is our main microcontroller. It is the brain of this board. It is doing all the calculations and writing it down to the memory chip and the memory chip is here. There is nothing exciting about that, it just stores the data. Here is our temperature sensor which measures the temperature and sends the data to microcontroller. And on the battery we have a buzzer, you can get beeps out of it. Some of the components are missing in the board. This is the antenna area and you have two LEDs and two buttons and it is all about this board. Here are the pins that I like about. We have some on the bottom left corner and also smaller ones on the top of the board. These are the test pins used during the development stage and after the development has been completed they usually left those exposed. Because removing those also costs some engineering time. Also it is always good to have those after the development because if something goes wrong you can always do a little bit investigation or reflash your chip if you had some bugs in your firmware. And if we flip over the board, well, there is nothing much here actually. However, there are traces that you can follow and it helps you to see how components are connected to each other. Next step is the identifying components. This part is a little bit tricky. You need to move around your PCB a little bit to read the labels of the chips which are placed on the PCB. For example, this one is marked as CC2541. And the temperature sensor is marked as SI705. It is from Silicon Labs. And the memory chip is from Adesto, never heard of it. It has 64 megabit capacity and control with the SPI interface. By typing name of the chip, you can find a lot more information on the internet. You can find which type of chip they have used. And this is from Texas Instruments and it is Bluetooth Low Energy and Proprietary Wireless MCU. And I would directly download the datasheet because you can see every information about this chip in this document. One of the most important thing that you want to check here is the pinout and it exposes every pins and also definitions of the pins as well. Then I would save this file in my working folder. You can learn lots of information from their product page. For example, Ereta Note is one of them and definitely worth checking. And you can find example softwares in their page as well. For example, if you get this one, download this one, you can get all the software examples for each functionality that chip have. Also, they have a Bluetooth stack and this file includes all the Bluetooth examples in one folder. They are like examples on the Arduino boards. Okay, you got your examples, but then you need to find a way to upload your code on the chip. And chip manufacturers also tells you their way to program their chips as well. So for example, for this chip, you need to buy their debugger and programmer and it's around 50 bucks. And this is actually the easiest way and if you have money just go for it. Usually I try to avoid paying any money for the programmers and try to find a free alternative to this. In fact, the chip that I have on my board has the same chip the one that HM10 modules have, which is quite popular on the Arduino board for communicating through Bluetooth. So you don't need to of course 
use them as a separate module you can just program this chip and do the same thing that you can do with an arduino without any need for arduino module but anyway if you go to the github page you can find lots of cool projects which is using the same chip and i usually go with the most stars it gives me the best results if you are looking for a cool project with the same chip you can of course go to their projects flash that one in your board but i am looking for a firmware uploader or a programmer if you would like to call it that way so for example i was able to find one for raspberry pi it lets you to program these chips using raspberry pi but also i was able to find another one which lets you to program these chips using an arduino board after downloading it all you need to do is go to arduino folder and upload it to your arduino board so you just saved 50 bucks and many thanks to the contributors of this project now you have your software examples and also your programmer as well what's left is to have a compiler and i just learned that i need ir embedded workbench for a251 to compile the examples and all you need to do is doing a web search and you can find the compiler and you can try it for free and i think it is a bit of a shame that texas instrument does not support these chips in their own debugger and development environment it is the code composer studio which is free by the way this compiler is quite pricey so not really for a maker anyway but you can get the 14 day trial version if you are expecting that your project to take more than 14 days i recommend you to install the software in a virtual machine once the trial period has ended you can request a new trial after looking a bit in the cc loader project i learned that this one is only compatible with the bin files the ir compile produces hex files so you need to find a way to convert hex files to bin files and you can easily find project like this for example hex to bin is perfectly suitable for this purpose you just need to download it and you can use it to convert your hex files to binary files if i take a look at the picture which is provided in the cc loader github page we need to connect arduino uno boards from d4 to d6 to dd dc and reset pins but we don't know the pinout of the r target board yet so next thing we need to do is to find that to do that usually i just take pictures of the board and try to be as parallel to the pcb as possible and after getting both sides of the pcb then i just put it on my computer and what i like to work with is to have a software which lets me to manipulate images and which supports the layers of course and i would recommend you gimp because it is free and also open source and i would even consider it as a professional grade just download it and install it to your computer after this i will put these pictures in two different layers front and back and i would try to match the holes for example here and here you see and to be able to do that you can change the opacity from here and you can actually see if they are matching or not they don't need to be perfectly matching but if they match like 90 percent or something that will be enough for you and I will get the bucket tool from the toolbox. It is the same tool from the Microsoft Paint and paint the traces. It is pretty easy to find all the traces and I usually paint the ones on the front to red and the ones on the back to blue. So if you need to change the opacity of the layers, you can actually see where all these pins are going and then i would open the datasheet of the chips go to the pinout and get a snapshot of the pinout then i would paste it just right on the chips and it will help me to determine the pinouts it makes it things quite easier because if you remember to program this chip we need dd dc and reset pins also power and ground pins as well if you remember from the datasheet we need to find 
P2.1 and P2.2 and it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 pins. But they end here. You can easily hide this layer and of course mark them and here we were able to find the programming pins and i like marking them because usually it becomes quite useful you can also see it from the front side of the pcb as well also i type in the name of the chips and also i try to be careful about the orientation of the text so i can remember which side this chip is placed on the pcb and since i was able to find the programming pings i cannot determine the reset pin on this pinouts but this shape of the pins awfully look like jtag connector and if you type in cc2541 jtag i was able to actually find the jtag interface so i will just copy this picture as well get a snapshot of it and paste it to the gimp in the gimp i see this area doesn't have any interesting components and i will place this jtag adapter to here to make a reference and if you can take a look at the pinout it exactly matches the one that i have and i was looking for the reset pin so i will take a shot and try this one as a reset pin and i'm pretty sure this is just going to work out then i connected my arduino board to my target board as it's shown here with the correct pins now we have everything ready right now i will go to hex to bin file and put it in the terminal then i will go to the folder where all the examples are located and i want to try first the blink example and it is the timer examples then i will find the compiled hex file inside of the folders for my target and put that one into the powershell as well after hitting enter it will create the bin file and we are ready to upload our code and i will go to the cc loader file and drag and drop that one type one that's the port of your arduino is connected to your pc and again browse back to the debug folder where our binary folder is located and drag and drop that one as well to the powershell and after that a leave blank and type zero zero is for arduino no and this will upload our code to our target board of course normally you would automate all the steps but i wanted to show manual way at least once and like we were expecting it here is your blink sketch and now you can treat this board as any other development board and try out your own codes on it Originally I wanted to show how you can control the sensors on the board as well, but this video became a bit long. I can show you that part too if you think that is also interesting. Just leave a comment under the video and I will see it. All this might look a little bit complicated at first, but each step has its own fun and I recommend this to every maker. If you like this video, don't forget to give a thumbs up and see you next time.